Hi everyone, it is the Good Doctors of Abbey Research here with you today, uh, Dr. Aaron Hinson and Dr. Kristen Donnelly. We are filming our Handmaid's Tale academic analysis videos because we're in the same space. Normally I'm in Pittsburgh uh, for most of the month until I come out here to Philadelphia where our company is based. But since we're in the same room today, two for the price of one, except this is a free video, uh, we are doing uh, several of these videos uh, this week. So we're today we are recapping Handmaid's Tale Season 2, Episode 2, Unwomen. And if you're wondering what that means, join us. <laughs> join us. Uh, because we have more questions after this particular episode than I am personally comfortable with. Um, <laughs> so we don't know what unwomen means. We open, it's it's essentially two parallel tales. We, we spend some time with Emily slash Off Glen slash Roy Gilmore. And she is in the colonies. Uh, and we're going to return to a question regarding the colonies in a few minutes. Uh, she's in the colonies and she's doing manual labor, cleaning up after some sort of nuclear annihilation. Uh, she and every other woman there look atrocious. Um, like they have been out in the weather forever because we find out that they have. Through the wars, literally. Um, and they are, they are all in this shade of blue, all these workers. Um, and then their overseers are in this maroon and they're all wearing gas masks. So clearly to me, the radiation is still apparent and present. Um, and we also get her flashbacks to when she was purged from the academic system. She was a microbiology professor. She was also married to a woman who's played by actor Cleo Duvall, who you know from everything. Everything. But also the girl from, uh, I think it's She's All That with the clown makeup on her face at the party. She is in She's yeah. All That. Yeah. 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 So she plays her wife, and we see the the two of them getting separated at immigration, the border. Um, and interestingly for all of us, the police and ICE are the same thing. In this American world, so mm -hmm. put a pin in that. Mm -hmm. Going on with June is that um, she spends most of this episode in the literal dark, <coughs> as we spend it in the metaphorical dark. Um, <laughs> she gets taken to a safe house, which ends up being the Boston Globe offices, but she refers to it as a slaughterhouse because it becomes very clear to us throughout the episode that the entire staff of the Boston Globe was assassinated either by hanging or shooting squad mm -hmm. in in the Boston Globe offices. So eyebrows slash boyfriend slash Nick joins her at one point. They have very athletic sex in many locations around the offices. Lots of anger. Um, there's a lot of dominance control uh, being worked out in that process. She, uh, at one point June just kind of tells him to give me the keys to the car because I'm going to start driving north and find Hannah and I'm going to go. And he's like, you can't do that. And she doesn't listen. And then she realizes that he's right. And then they have a lot of sex. This is how this is going. Yeah. Um, and then at the end, we find her, um, the end of the episode, we, uh, two things happen. Emily, um, let me go back to the Emily storyline um, in the colonies. A wife actually shows up in the colonies, and she's dun, played dun, dun. by Marissa Tomei. Right. Surprise. Um, but don't worry, Marissa Tomei around for one episode. So <laughs> uh, she gets sick because everybody does because you're digging radiation out of the ground. Um, and then we have this little exchange where wife is really sick, and we come to realize that Emily poisoned her. Oh, snap. Because what she says is that there are some things that aren't forgiven. You held a woman down for years while your husband raped her. Some things are not forgivable. Um, and in June's land, we find her watching a friend's DVD on somebody's laptop. And as, as you do. Laughing for the first time we've really ever seen her expressing emotions in a way that we've never seen before. Um, and drinking some coffee. And then she goes around the offices, gathers personal effects from everybody's desks. Because it's really clear that they were like purged from... The office, like, they're dragged away from their desks. We see a couple missing pairs of shoes, things like that. Um, and she builds a kind of shrine at the firing squad wall to all these all these people. She puts up personal effects. She gets candles. Um, and it's very clear to her that this, very clear to us, 
that for her, this is an incredibly key part of reconstructing her identity post being a handmaid. Um, I want to state here very briefly that at no point in time does she really eat any protein during this episode. <laughs> so our We're five, concerned for her health. There's also not clean water. So uh, five week pregnant June. Not getting the nutrients. I'm a little, I'm a little nervous. Um, in terms, the bulk of this episode is like right in Erin's wheelhouse of uh, discussion. She does a lot of work with objects. And so I'm going to turn most of this conversation over to her. But really briefly, let me say that from a religious standpoint, to me, the most significant thing that happened is that we hear about three chunks of religious prayers throughout this time. And all of the first two are the Gilead religion. They're rewriting of scripture where there is no... There is no Trinity. There is no Jesus. Salvation is entirely at the whim of a mercurial punishment-based God. Um, the authentic prayer from what we understand as Christianity comes at the very end, and it comes from June, when she actually utters one of the prayers for the dead that Catholics pray at a Mass. Um, and it is the actual only authentic holy moment I think we've had um, in 12 episodes in now. In the show. Yeah, in the whole show. And it was very telling to me that she did it after gathering objects in the way that she did. So, uh, drrr, take it away. I will show you my notes, of which there are many pages, many pages, but I condensed them, and I will be referring to them because I want to get everything that I want to say right. So, the first thing that really struck me in this episode from my perspective, my background um, actually is, is studying people who made objects, artworks, and crafts in prison and they consider themselves to be political prisoners. So we're in a very politicized world in Gilead. You could argue, I think, pretty easily that the handmaids are political prisoners mm -hmm. because of this new regime mm -hmm. that has taken over. Uh, so from my background, the first Right out of the bat, what got me was June's narrative while she was in the truck being transported to what we find out is the Boston Globe's office and her statement that we get so comfortable with walls. And she's kind of narrating this transition as she's escaping. And she talks about the language and the clothing and the behavior and all the ways that handmaids can form. And handmaids, particularly as her experience in Gilead, are de-individualized. So that's, I think, the framework for what we see June going through. Uh, and we can talk about, you know, confinement at another time that's going on with our dear Rory in the colonies. Mm. Um, because that is a, has the same elements of, of confinement and torture and, mm. and control that, that we see in Gilead mm. all the time. Um, but this idea that Gilead knows no bounds that she says, you know, Gilead knows no bounds. There is no physical nor psychological means of escape, even though literally what we're watching her do is escape from that life. So I loved that parallel. But it sets the stage for, from my perspective as a person who studies imprisonment, this idea of June experiencing the trauma of reintegration, which is something that people who are released from confinement or who escape from confinement have to deal with. You know, think of one of my favorite examples of, of the struggles of reintegration is the um, phenomenal film, uh, oh, The Shawshank Redemption. I was like, Andrew you Dufresne. There. You got there. Andrew yeah. Dufresne, The Shawshank Redemption. And uh, you see all of the experiences of the men who know no other life outside of that um, because they've been in prison for so long. So we don't know how long June has been a handmaid, but we know it's not that long because um, we kind of tell a time on the age of her daughter. We think? Um, we That's think. a question we have for a couple minutes from now. Um, but we, she is reintegrating back into a pre-handmade identity. She shed all of that. She cleansed herself of all of that in the last episode. Um, but she's reintegrating back into this abnormal society. So that's the struggle she's going through, is this kind of trauma of finding herself again in these spaces. Um, and the other thing that we talked about a lot when we were hashing out what this episode was about was the util utilitarianism of Gilead. Mm -hmm. Everybody serves a purpose. Even there are no so maybe unwomen means there are no women anymore. You don't have a maybe we're not sure. You don't have gender identifiers. People are either their title or their name. That's yeah, it. Yeah. That is it. So you are a handmaid or a Martha or an I 
or a commander. Um, but anyway, so I think this utilitarianism is taking away any sort of personal identification, right? Which we've seen this. So flash forward to the trauma of reintegration in the Boston Globe offices. Mm -hmm. And you see her start to freak out about what she's realizing mm -hmm. took place in this space. And for me, it was this dichotomy between the conformity of surviving, surviving conformity versus surviving outside the literal and metaphorical walls of her confinement. Yeah. So we're seeing her deal with this and, and especially in her argument with Nick about where she's going and what she wants to do and how she thinks she can get out of this. She has to escape this reality. Her escape has to become fully realized, but that doesn't happen. Uh, and then we see these emotional responses that for the first time she actually is able to have them without the fear of being found. I'll switch to page two. So this brings me to the power of objects. If you want to hit pause and go get a drink here, she's about to kind of go <laughs> off. So, um, And as I mentioned, my, re my PhD research was literally looking at the significance of objects for people who were imprisoned. So when this... Get when, a drink. When my brain started swirling with this episode, uh, I was really excited. Uh, and one of the things that I found through my research was that objects, everyday objects, the stuff we collect, our knickknacks, the things we have hanging on the walls, are repositories for memories and they're signifiers of who we are. It's how we tell our stories. The objects that we collect and we <clears throat> save and that we give prominence to and that we display on our desks, in our homes, all of that stuff. And archaeologists analyze artifacts to learn about past societies and civilizations, right? So that's it kind of struck me that she was almost like an archaeologist walking around this abandoned yeah. Pompeii-esque because it was very sudden. There were papers everywhere. There were shoes. It was like bags falling down the stairs. Like clearly like, people were running and they got pulled. Yeah, like, my first thought chaos. was like Pompeii. This yeah. happened very suddenly, yeah. whatever took place. And then obviously we find out what took place. Yeah. Uh, Gilead. <laughs> Gilead happened. Gilead yeah. happened. Um and she walks through the desks, and we learn about the people, Boston Red Sox fans, Celtics fans, mothers, people who love sailing, all of these objects that signify who these people were as individuals. And we now live in a society where there aren't individuals anymore. And let me pause here really quick, because I think you, for anyone who ha doesn't watch episodes super, super closely, she realizes all of this when she is drinking out of a world's greatest boss mug. <laughs> So what I what I think happened in her brain is that she realized that she was appropriating other people's lives and other people's objects. Mm. And so she doesn't want to do that because that was done to her. Yeah. And so then this this so then she starts gathering objects and then she knows what's going on. And the world's greatest boss mug she was drinking out of becomes part of the becomes part of the shrine. Yes, and that was very important. And and one of the things that I realized as well too is that in certain situations of confinement and imprisonment and incarceration, when you're de-individualized, your right to own objects is very often mm. taken away. True statement. Depending on the level of confinement or incarceration you're facing, particularly in situations of political incarceration. Yeah. Because anything can be politicized. Anything that represents who you are as a person, as an individual, threatens your confinement threatens the control of whoever, the power, the authority that is keeping you there. Um, so it can be used as a means of resistance, these objects. So that's why we don't see them in the homes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, except for the lovely library that the commander has. Um, but the handmaids certainly aren't given personal objects or allowed to have personal objects or the Marthas, we presume. We don't know anything about the Marthas. We're going to put a pin in that because... Mm -hmm. Uh, this one here has some thoughts about why they're called Martha's, so heads up for that. That's going to be coming for you guys. So for me, the biggest moment of this, and this is my final, final, final thought, the most potent part of the episode is when she makes this shrine. Because if objects tell our stories, our, our personal histories as individuals, as people, as humans, fundamentally humans, who are emotional and have expressions and love and relationships and connections. These people in the Boston Globe offices have been erased. They have been purged. Mm -hmm. And so the shrine that June sets up becomes their eulogy. It becomes their epitaph. 
their story reclaims that space that has been left. I mean, the building's abandoned, but we all know that Gilead leaves these spaces of execution as a threat, as a reminder. So they become, in anthropological terms, commemorative spaces. The state is commemorating fear and control uh, and submission, conformity. And June, in her beautiful, beautiful forms of resistance, is reclaiming it, re-sanctifying it, even through the prayer, as a space for remembrance of these people's lives. So the objects carry so much meaning and so much power symbolically for these people. And that was, for me, as an anthropologist who studies artifacts, absolutely fascinating. So that is what I took away from this episode, which was a lot. We have lots of other questions going forward for episode three and four, which land this week. Yeah, so we have some real questions about the geography of Gilead, and we're a little bit divided on this. So I think Gilead is just Boston. And then the colonies is everything else. That There was some sort of nuclear attack maybe in D.C. Yeah. Because then the fallout would be wherever. Um, Aaron thinks that Gilead's a little bit bigger than just Boston. A little bit, but I mean, the we didn't get a lot of signifiers we don't know. from the colonies. It could be... Ohio, it could be Iowa. Yeah, um, it, it it like it could it it looks pretty like outside of coal country, but before we hit the Rockies, like but yes. nuclear fallout, I we have no idea. We don't know. So that's Question. an issue um, because then I have some questions about like where Jezebel's is physically, where the Boston Globe office is physically. It, she's not out of Gilead yet, but it's clearly not in a celebrated part of Gilead yeah. because they're not making it. It's not, no one else is in the building. They're not using it. They're not using it as a piece of control. Right. Also, all of the houses seem to be super wealthy. So I'm like, are they hanging with the Romneys? Like, what's going on? Boston Common? Like, what is What is happening? So we have that question. We have a timeline question, a significant timeline question, um, because we're kind of gauging by Hannah, but that's not fair because actresses grow before characters do. So, like. June referenced Yelp. So. Yeah. And then the Friends are on DVD. And those, like, single DVDs you used to be able to buy at Walmart for, like, $5 that are, like, only a couple (laughs) episodes. So we're thinking like late aughts. We like, spent some time thinking about this yesterday. We did. This is the work we do for you. This is how we <laughs> serve you. So I've got some questions about that. And then also, like Dr. Hinson said, um, I have a lot of thoughts about why they're called Martha's. And Martha is a very heavy Protestant um, identity of a woman in scripture. Mm-hmm. And so as we started talking about that, and then also about one of our questions is, why do they keep hanging people? Why aren't they using something else? We realized that there are some deep dives we're going to do, and Mm -hmm. we've fallen down some rabbit holes. So as an additional service... Um, to, we are givers. We just, it's, we're rivers. We just give, and we give, and we give. Um, we are going to do some asides of supplemental videos um, in our own expertise. So I'll be coming at you um, this week or next with What's a Martha? Yep. And why I think it's a Martha and who Martha is and all that kind of stuff. Uh, Aaron's going to be unpacking the history of capital punishment. And why we're using hanging. I have some inklings that Gilead is anti-industrialist. We think so. So therefore they'd be Victorian, which fits their sexual, like, ethic. And dress. Yeah, so we're going to dig into those things. We've got some questions, some things to look into. And we also have absolutely zero confidence that they're going to answer those questions. <laughs> they don't like to tell us. Because they're not, they're like middle distance folks. So um, another thing we're keeping an eye on is that, um, you know, in the list of how you run a coup. Yeah. Because um, this is not a revolution. This was not at the will of the people. This was not a revolution. This was a coup. Right. So this is like, a, do you want to build a coup? On the list. We have a checklist. Um, we're at, we've silenced the press. We've purged the universities. We've de- we've defined what familial relationships can look like. We've militarized um, the police. We've militarized the police. So a couple things left is the destruction of the government, which may have happened with the D.C. bombing that we talked about because they talked about martial law. Yes. More questions. So we're keeping an eye on the coup checklist. Um, and in the meantime, whatever episodes drop tomorrow, uh, we would encourage you to take a deep breath before watching them because this is this show is pedal on the gas banana pants um and we don't know what's going on and we'll be back with you next week for episode three and two weeks from now for episode four um yes yes and um help you figure out what's going on so that is everything we have for this episode two on women 
I didn't look up what episode three is called yet. They might not have even told us, but that will be up next week. This will be going up on YouTube and Facebook and promoed on all of our social media accounts. Anywhere you find Abby Research, you will find this video. It's been great talking to you guys. Remember to comment with your thoughts on what we've said. We've been loving the back and forth and helping us think through this as you guys are such a gift. See you later. Bye. <laughs>